Hello, this is Robert Stearns. Hey, I want to thank you for tuning in. I really believe that learning is one of the greatest joys in life. And one of the greatest ways to learn is simply to have meaningful conversations, both with those who come from a similar background as yours, as well as those whose background might be very different. So my hope is that as we connect and converse with leaders from all around the world, that we will learn and grow together. If you're new with us, hit the subscribe button and we'll deliver the new episodes to you right away. So wherever you are, on a run, in the car, at the kitchen table with some coffee, welcome to the conversation. All right, everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. One of the highlights of the week, Bishop and the Rabbi, great to be together. Ladies and gentlemen, families, people from everywhere, where do we have tonight? We've got uh, Grandma Margie is here from Delaware. Laverne is here from Brooklyn. Mom is here from Boyertown, Pennsylvania. Rebecca, Buffalo, New York. Lynn is here from West Seneca. Lynn, I hope you got that post that I left uh, on your uh, Facebook, that very special commemoration that you and your family uh, are walking through. We honor you and we honor the memory uh, of your late husband. Uh, Terry, it's great to see you tonight. Hi, Carol is here from Pennsylvania. Hi, Terry is here from Columbus, Indiana. Uh, Denise is here from Youngstown, Ohio. I'll be in Ohio on Saturday. We're going to the Ramp Conference in, that's in Youngstown, I think. Denise, maybe we'll see you there. Uh, hi, Sonia. We appreciate you, Sonia. Hey, David from Boyertown. Palm Coast, Florida is here. Uh, Ryan Kramer. Great to have you, Ryan. Ryan, are you a first timer? Ryan, I think I saw you. Did I see you on the uh, Rick Pino class that I did uh, the other day? Tennessee is in the house. Pastor Joe Green is with us. Newark, New Jersey. Deborah, Tom's River, New Jersey. Rob Deacon from Rochester. Uh, Dee and Harry are on from Estero. It was so good to see you guys at, at breakfast, uh, or the brunch. We did a wonderful partners brunch on Saturday. Oh, by the way, um, is it next week or the week after? I, I'm, I have to be very honest with everybody. I did not sleep well last night, and I don't feel awake. And I thought to myself, I should get coffee. But if I get coffee, I'm not going to sleep tonight. So pray for pr pray for some, pray for me, everybody. Yes, Ryan, we saw you with Rick Pino. Great to have you here tonight. But I was saying that we are heading down to Cranford, New Jersey, not this Sunday, next Sunday. And uh, we'll be doing a partner's uh, brunch for all my partners down in that New Jersey area. So uh, if you're a partner, I, I think that one is for our, um, I think it's for our watchmen and stakeholders partners, but you'll get an email on that. Boston is in the house. Trisha Miller is with us from Boston. We're going to be in Boston later this year. With uh, oh, that's actually coming up, I think, isn't it, Trisha? Trisha, drop that in. We're doing a Boston Celebrates Israel event. Trisha, of course, works for Camera, the wonderful Jewish organization. She's one of the heads of outreach for uh, Camera, and uh, I'll be up in Boston for that uh, gathering that is coming up as well. Well, forgive me if I didn't get to you. There's lots of folks signing in uh, and watching tonight, also on YouTube. Great to have everybody here. Couple quick announcements. Here we go, fast, because I want to get to. Our, we are so honored. I'm telling you, one of the great, great leaders uh, in our world today is with us, and and we want to get to him as quickly as possible. But a few quick announcements. <clears throat> Join us uh, in Israel. We're going in September. COVID, no COVID. Flights, no flights. If we have to get on a boat and row <laughs> and row across the Atlantic, we're gonna go. Danny, will you help us row if we go? All right. We get, shout out to Ashley and Danny and my production team and Dina. Uh, they're all here doing a great job. If you register, and by the way, we've already had, I think, 22 of you register. If you register before March 31st, you save $100. Do we have a slide for that? We'll try to get it up there. But um, if you register before March 31st, so go to awakejerusalem.com awakejerusalem.com. This is your year to come to Israel. So join us there. It's going to be amazing. 
uh, want to let you know about that. When we go, we will visit our two Abraham's Bread feeding centers. Together, you and I have the privilege of feeding hundreds of Israelis every single week. Through our partnership with Mayor Panim, we have a feeding center in Jerusalem, uh, right near the central bus station downtown, and a feeding center on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and we feed hundreds of people six days a week. When they come to the door, we don't ask them, hey, are you Jewish? Uh, are you Christian? Are you Muslim? Are you Druze? Are you Bedouin? We say, are you hungry? Come on in. You are our guest. Uh, our feeding centers uh, are not soup kitchens. They are run as restaurants. All of our clients are treated with dignity. They're sat at beautiful tables. And you and I are able to reach out uh, and express the heart of God, which is a heart of generosity, a heart of caring. So join us and help us bless Israel by becoming a partner and supporting Abraham's bread. You can go um, to uh, eagleswings.org forward slash partner, and you can become a friend of Israel for $18 a month, Key of David, $36 a month, Watchman, $72 a month. And like these various uh, brunches that I've just had, etc., there are different um, thank you gifts that you get as you partner with me in different levels. Folks, I need your partnership. We, we are in a very unusual space. There are not many organizations or ministries who walk out uh, Jerusalem-based Christianity. And sometimes we're too we're too Jewish for the Christians and too Christian for, Christian for the Jews. And we're, we're these people who are trying to help bridge a gap that is 2,000 years old. And, uh, and we need your help to do that. And uh, if you sign up, you get, you get our beautiful Bishop and the Rabbi mug. There it is. There's our great Bishop and the Rabbi mug. So go to the website and become my partner. Finally, really quick. Um, oh, there it is right there in front of me, the 28th. I'm at Calvary Tabernacle in Cranford, New Jersey on Sunday, the 28th. All right. Sunday, the 28th, Calvary Tabernacle, Cranford, New Jersey, which means our partner's brunch is the 27th. And then uh, about two weeks after that, we'll get you this. I'll be speaking in Orlando, Florida uh, at the Great Holy Spirit Conference there. And uh, so I'll look forward to seeing you in Orlando a few weeks after that. Finally, last announcement, I think, uh, Torah Tuesdays. All right, everybody, Torah. If you are a part of Torah Tuesdays, just type in real quick. I love Torah Tuesdays. Just type something in real quick. Um, if you are a part of Torah Tuesdays. Uh, okay, Trisha Miller says, May 23rd, I will be in Boston. All right, I got to get all these dates right. So March 28th. Uh, Cranford, New Jersey, then we'll get you the Orlando dates in April, and then May 23rd in Boston. Torah Tuesdays at 12 with our dear friend Mark Gerson. He teaches us every single Tuesday, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. Most of us are making <clears throat> our way through this incredible new book, The Telling. It's been such a blessing for us. Today, I was on the phone with the president of the University of Valley Forge, uh, in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, that is the Assembly of God University of the Northeast. It's also my alma mater. And they said, we want to bring the telling to the universe. And he said, do you know what he said to me? The president today, Dr. Kim, he said, I've never been in Israel. He said, would Eagle's Wings organize an Israel trip for us? So we're going to bring the students of Valley Forge. I don't know if I was supposed to announce that publicly, but <laughs> I just did. See, I didn't get enough sleep and I'm in rare form. All right, everybody, that is... I think the bulk of our announcements, so much going on, uh, TorahTuesdays.com, everybody, uh, to join us. There's no cost. It's free of charge, but you do need to register so we can send you the link. <clears throat> well, every year um, I am blessed to take part in a wonderful think tank, a gathering of, of leaders and friends. It's usually in Washington, D.C., and it's the annual Jewish Christian um, dialogue group and uh, great folks like Tony Campolo and many others are a part of that. And through that great group, I, I uh, met uh, our, our esteemed guest today. And, you know, you can be in a room full of people. And uh, have you ever had the circumstance that you're in a room full of people, but just, you know, one or two just really radiate in the midst of the room and, and very sincerely there was something about this brother's 
uh, in, 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 in Hebrew, I think it's nefesh. There was something about his soul. There was something about his heart that just radiated um, such a sense of kindness, such a sense of fairness, uh, such a sense of a pursuit of justice. And Rabbi Jonah Pesner serves as the director of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism since 2015. So for the past uh, six, almost seven years. Newsweek magazine has named him one of the most influential rabbis in America. Can you imagine that? Newsweek magazine, and he's spending time with us tonight. Uh, he is focused on encouraging Jewish communities all across lines of race, class, and faith as he campaigns for, uh, for social justice. And we know that this is such a part of Jewish tradition uh, to, to look for equity, to look for justice, to look for, uh, for uh, you know, to care for the oppressed. Where does it go back to? We're learning this with Mark. It goes back to, remember, we were slaves in Egypt. There is that sense of corporate memory that all of us, each and every, and Christians, of course, uh, we, we would say, remember, we were slaves to sin. We were apart from the knowledge of God. But by God's mercy, by God's grace, we were drawn near. And so uh, Rabbi uh, is, is an amazing, amazing leader. Uh, he's brilliant. He is energetic. He's on the front lines uh, of the Jewish community. Uh, he and his lovely wife, uh, Dana, have four amazing daughters. One of their daughters is getting ready to head over to Jerusalem. Would you give a huge Eagle's Wings welcome to our dear guest, Rabbi Jonah Pesner. Rabbi, there you are. Welcome, sir. So good to have you tonight. I'm thrilled, Bishop. Thank you so much. Well, it's uh, it's an honor to have you. And for those who are not familiar, uh, just give us a little bit of the background of of the center, the Religious Action um, Center. You're you're based there in Washington D.C. I'm here in Washington, and I do have the honor to lead the Reform Jewish Movement. We are the largest and most diverse denomination in Jewish life, Bishop. There are 2 million Reform Jews. There are 900 congregations across North America and all of your followers, wherever they live, there are Reform Jews in their neighborhood who would love to connect with them, study with them, pray with them, and join you on your Israel trips, by the way. Next time, I wanna see you there. When we're in person again, I wanna be in person in Jerusalem. And I love you, Bishop Stern. I, I got to say, like, you have brought tens of thousands of people to experience the joy and the beauty of the land of Israel. And what a gift that is. My One of my favorite theologians, Ahad Ha'am, said that Israel should be like a light into the nations. And what happens there should be about righteousness and compassion. And the fact that you do Abraham's bread, is that the name of the group? Yes. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Muslim, Christian, Jew, Druze, just if you are hungry, come and eat. So... Anyway, so I, I do, I'm here in Washington. I'm in the Washington office of our Reform Jewish Movement. I build relationships across lines with Muslims, Christians, um, people of all faith, people of no faith, to pursue policies that will make the lives of working people and all people better. You know, Rabbi, I, what I love about what you're saying is it reminds me so much of Jesus. Uh, you know, you're, you're sitting there saying, oh, yes, Rabbi. Yes. Yes. You say we deal with Muslims, we deal with it. And you put that in Jesus' context. And what's that? We deal with Samaritans, we deal with Jews, we talk to, right? We talk to the woman at the well. I mean, Jesus was notorious for speaking to groups of people that he shouldn't be speaking to. This was the real, this was the drama that surrounded Jesus, whether he was talking to tax collectors who, you know, to be a tax collector was to be, you know, in bed with the enemy, in bed with the Roman Empire, uh, or the Samaritans, right, who were, uh, you know, um, uh, theologically, you know, verboten to the, and yet Jesus found a way to affirm the image of God, even in, in every person, even if they were not from his group, and, and, and I, isn't that what we're called to do, to, to, to start from the place of affirming the dignity of each person? Amen. And I, one of the things I love about my Christian family and Jesus is the way in which he associated himself with the least of these and with the most vulnerable. And Jesus connected with everybody. I hear you. 
and saw mm -hmm. the divinity. It says in, in Bereshit very clearly, every human was created in God's image. And, and I, I, had a, I had a teacher, Bishop Stearns, who used to say to me, if that's true, then when you're on the New York City subway, you look into the eyes of every person in that subway car, no matter how dangerous they look or how disheveled right. they look, and you see God in those eyes. And Jesus like saw God in everyone and mostly focused on the, in the sick and the most vulnerable and the poor. And that's why I love working with my Christian family. Well, it's, it's beautiful. We are so honored to have you tonight. And uh, everybody, we're going to get started in just a moment. I want you to find your Bibles, get your notebooks. We're going to turn to Leviticus chapter 1, everybody. We're going to be in Leviticus chapter 1 through the end of chapter 5. Now, it's that time, folks. I need you to do one thing. One thing I need you to do. <laughs> I need you to hit the share button, everybody. This is that time, okay? Uh, who's going to do it first? You know, type in, let me know. But hit the share. We, we have a lot more folks who've joined. Kevin, God bless you. Welcome you. To you, Kevin. Kevin, is it your first time? I don't recognize your name. You say shalom, y'all. So something tells me you're All from right. the south. It's and, our other uh, brother is in the house. <laughs> exactly. That is right. Lots of new folks. Diana's here from Anaheim, California. Uh, guys, uh, hit the share button, please. Help us get the word out. Laverne, you get the prize. Laverne's the first one who shared. Well, but Ryan says he already. Ryan, you're a first timer and you already shared. My, my goodness. Send Ryan a bishop in the rabbi mug. Ryan, drop us your address, email the office. You get an honorary bishop in the rabbi mug. And by the way, rabbi, you're, you're, this goes to the mail to you tomorrow. Uh, so I you, was going to say, I, I have to work for my mug, apparently. Yeah, so yeah. Ryan, it easy. <laughs> you're joining a select group of rabbis who have one of these. In bishop, I have one question for you, Bishop. What, what took you so long? You've had like dozens of rabbis on the show. I'm like the latest to the dance. We, you know, we save the best, right? For there, there it is. There it uh, is. You save, the, you save the best for the portion in Leviticus that talks about ritual sacrifice. That's what you did. <laughs> That's it. Well, and and so we come to it. Uh, Vaikra is the name of this week's portion, and it is uh, it's the portion everybody that deals with the five different types of sacrifice that that Hashem that the Lord told the children of Israel to bring. And uh, Rabbi will discuss this with us in a moment. But five different types of sacrifices that we were, the children of Israel were to bring. If you remember, they had built the sanctuary. Um, God had given very clear instructions for the building of the sanctuary not to be filled with the golden calf, not to be filled with physical things, because how many times when we're not careful can physical things easily become an idol to us, but to allow space for the presence of God, the Shekhinah, to allow space for God, who is spirit, to be there and for us to dwell with God, for God to dwell with us in the midst of that sanctuary. So, Rabbi, uh, you're right. This is a tough passage. Uh, you know, my oldest son, when he had his uh, bar mitzvah, he got the... Um, he got the portion. Is it called uh, Metzora? Azria Metzora. He won yeah, the lottery. It's the worst portion. <laughs> it's the portion that deals with leprosy. Yeah. And he's like, why did I get the portion that deals with leprosy? But he did a great job finding a wonderful redemptive I, you, thing. I, so Rabbi, I, assume, I assume you told him the answer that many fathers of bar mitzvah boys have given over the centuries, right? You uh, well, say no, because Oh, how many, how many, how many bar mitzvah boys have bishops for fathers? But go but, ahead. But it's right, exactly. So, like, obviously, God had a plan, right? So the kids is like, how could I have gone to Zaria Mitzora, the the leprosy portion? Well, because you're Jewish. <laughs> That's good. And you're Jewish with a bishop as a father. That's very, very good. God has a sense of humor. That is fantastic. All right, everybody. Uh, Kevin says Torah Tuesday visited. Shared. Thank you, Kevin. We're so glad to have you uh, here tonight. All right, everybody. Uh, Rabbi Vaikra, uh, Leviticus 1 through 5, walk us through. This is a desert nomadic tribe. They've come out of bondage. They've had this epic transformational revelatory moment at Sinai, and they're just beginning their peoplehood. They're just beginning their corpus of worship. And, and Hashem gives them these five sacrifices. What in the world does this have to do with us today in modern living? Take it away. It's such a spectacular and gorgeous Parsha. And think about it, Bishop. The whole book, this third book is named Vayikra. 
So right in the center of his journey from slavery to the promised land, the Torah stops and gives an entire book on ritual and engagement with God and the community. And it all starts with that word, Vaikra. So I want people at home to say it with us. And Vaikra means what, Rabbi? And he called. And he called. So all of this, people get lost in the weeds, right? You're going to think about the, you know, the burnt offerings and the meal offerings and the bird offerings. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a second. But just Bishop, just savor that. This whole segment starts with a call. Beautiful. You know something about that, don't you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> your, your people, right, talk about this call, don't they? Everybody Absolutely. on this Facebook was called tonight, right? Right. Were we not all called to this place? Mm-hmm. And here's where it gets beautiful. So the word in Hebrew for the sacrifices, which, so it basically the text is God called to Moses and said, instruct the children of Israel. This is how they're going to do their ritual sacrifices. And the sacrifices are called korbanot. Korbanot, which is translated as sacrifice, but here's what it really means. It's from the Hebrew verb lakriv, to draw near. The sacrifice to draw near to God. When we came forward with our offering, it was a way to get close. And we weren't just getting close to God. We were getting close to one another. So this whole thing is a metaphor for us today. How do we get close to God? How do we hear God's voice and be called? How do we draw near to one another? And think about your ministry and these tabernacles of David that you created. This is what the ancient Israelites were doing and what God had in mind. Put up a tent. In this Torah portion, it's called the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting. You call the tabernacle of David, same thing. Come together in song, in worship. We don't sacrifice goats anymore, Mm -hmm. right? But we offer the sacrifices of our time and our energy and our money. You you did a call earlier for tzedakah, for charity, for an offering, and people offer prayers. This is the way today we draw near to God and, to, and towards one another. Am I making sense? It, it, it's so, uh, honestly, I have chills. I mean, it's incredible. So we start with Vayikra where it says, and he called. And you know, Rabbi, I, I forever, it just is etched in my mind. We go back to, to Abraham, you know, Lechacha. You know, Abraham lives in, in polytheism. He lives with no sense that there is one distinct voice. There's the moon God and there's the river God and the, you know, all, and yet in the midst of that cacophony uh, of, 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 of many gods, he hears a voice that breaks through and it's, it's the architect of the universe. It's, it's, it's the divine one. And he, he, he speaks to Abraham and, and God is still speaking to each of us Amen. if we will listen. Amen. And from that calling comes the, the Corbinote, which you said is translated here sacrifice. But, and this is what we love about Hebrew, and we're learning this every week as we go along, that actually the roots of, of the Hebrew words are so important. And the root for you is we think of sacrifice, oh, I have to give a sacrifice. I've got to do this. I've got to, but it literally means to draw near. So when I am doing that, I have this opportunity to draw near to God and I can sanctify what I am doing and really make it holy by doing it with intention that God, I'm doing this as an act of drawing near to you. That's what you're telling us. And I'll take it one step further. The first whole basket of offerings is called the Ola. And Bishop, you know about Ola. It's the same word, Aliyah, going up. Now, for the ancient, right, it was logical. They would take a piece of meat and they would burn it. And for them in the ancient world, like when you burn something, the smoke rises and it's a way. If you wanted to give a calf to God, you can't just throw it up. It's going to land on your head, right? But if you burn it and it would say that the the odor, the pleasant fragrance was pleasing mm-hmm. to God. Yeah. So the going up of the sacrifice is the way to actually give a gift to God. But here's the thing. You bring up 25,000 of your followers, Bishop, to Jerusalem, they are making aliyah. It's the same word, the olah. They are offering themselves up at the mountain. 
And God is in some way inhaling the souls, the spirits, and the breath of all of your followers who are connecting with God on the mountain. We, we really believe that. And we believe there is this going up in this moment in time, this, um, as you say, this aliyah, who may ascend the hill of the Lord, he with clean hands and a pure heart. We're, and it's, folks, when you come with us to Israel, there's this one moment, I'll never, someone just texted me about Jose Diaz. I'll never forget. I, I think he's on right now, but, uh, you know, you're on the bus and you come around the corner, you're coming up from Tel Aviv and all of a sudden you see, I, I could, I could cry right now. You see Jerusalem spread out in front of you and, and you are literally going up to Jerusalem. And for many people, it becomes this spontaneous, incredible moment. Uh, Jose, who was with us, I mean, he just, and Jose is not a crier. Uh, uh, Pastor Jose, we love Pastor, and he just, I was, I, I will forever, I was sitting right, and he just weeps. I said, Jose, what is this? It's Jerusalem. And beloved, we are invited to spiritually ascend every single day. Amen. We are invited to spiritually connect with the world that is beyond the physical every single day, not by in some ascetic way divorcing ourselves from pain or you know removing ourselves from the pain of the world but finding god's presence in the midst of it you know i think of amazing examples like mother teresa who said i want to go live with jesus in the midst of the poor uh you know just really reaching out in that incredible way and and so rabbi it's just awesome rabbi talk to us for a moment about this tent of meeting because um, it was Rab it was Rabbi Stanton last week, uh, and and he shared with us that you know the golden calf was filling space, but the tent of meeting at this point, you know, it's it, it's just so much of it is left empty because God is there in the absence. We we find God mm. in the silence. We find you know be still and know that I am God. Talk to us a little bit about that, Rabbi. My, I, my favorite aspect of the tabernacle, and uh, maybe Rabbi Stan or one of the other I always reference this, so stop me if you've heard this one before, as they say. When God commands us to build the tabernacle, that portable dwelling place that we can move throughout our journeys in the wilderness, that will be replaced someday by the temple, right? So that you do want to have a permanent structure, but God says, build me a tabernacle so that I can dwell among them now it's strange because you would think god would say build me a tabernacle so i can dwell in it mm. in it in the tabernacle but god doesn't say that god says betocham among them and the commentators read this and say ah god is telling us something very important god does not dwell in physical structures god dwells in people and god doesn't want to dwell in people alone that's not to say that everybody Tonight, when we sh sign off the, the Facebook Live and we're, you know, alone in our, God will be with us. Amen. But God also wants us to come together either physically into the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting, or the virtual Ohel Moed that Bishop Stearns has created, where thousands of people all over the United States have come together into this Ohel Moed because God dwells not in it, but among them. So there's a Hasidic parable that says, where is God? Wherever you let God in. So here we are coming together to let God in. There's a beautiful verse, Rabbi. It's one of our favorites. It says um, that God dwells in the midst of the praises of his people. And you talked a moment ago, uh, maybe somebody will find that reference. I believe it's in the it's in the Tehillim in the Psalms. But you talked a moment ago, Rabbi, about you know the the smoke that rises, and that was the fragrance that was pleasing to God. By the way. That's my, my, I think it was my third book, Keepers of the Flame, came from that verse that what God is looking for, God wasn't looking for the sacrifice. God wasn't looking for the wood. God, God was looking for what would be released when the community of faith was all um, together, you know, uh, maintaining that eternal flame, which today, of course, is the... Uh, uh, the Nair Tamid that, that hangs in every synagogue in the world. It's hardwired in. That light never goes out. 
And to this day, the Jewish people uh, show forth the light of God. And when we light Shabbat candles, everybody, when you join us tomorrow night, 6 p.m., Facebook Live, it's Psalm 22.3. Uh, it says God dwells in the praises of his people. But I love that. It's of his people. It's when we are corporately together. It makes me think of the words of Jesus. who He says, when two or three are gathered together, I am, right, the great I am, in the midst of you. And so there is this thing, Rabbi, that God wants us to understand the power of community, the power of worship. And we need one another. And we are living in a polarized world. We are living in a fractured world. We are living in a toxic world where we too often um, forces beyond us, and I would argue from the left and the right, forces beyond us are trying to cause us to demonize the other, to vilify the other, to see evil or threat from the other. But God says, no, uh, I, I want you to build me a dwelling place on earth by amen. seeing my divine image in each and every person. Amen, amen. And two, two th quick things to say on that. One is, God does not care if you are red or blue or right or left. God cares if you have love in your heart and in your deeds. And I, I hope that one of the takeaways from this will be all of us will talk to somebody that usually disagrees with us and just listen a lot and try and hear God in their voice. Yeah. But here, here, I want to go back to the Nair Tamid for a second, because this is another great one, right? Everybody pick, you know, I don't know, uh, Bishop, if your sons did this, they you know, try and sneak into the sanctuary and see like, what would happen if you turned the switch off? <laughs> So this is a thing in the Jewish tradition, right? Like little boys go into the sanctuary and say like, well, what would happen, right? But here's the thing. And this is the whole point. Because in the text, it tells us light the light, not eternally, but perpetually. And what's the difference between it? eternal means it's always lit. But actually back in the ancient world, during the time of the Ohel Moed, the priests had to light it every day. Right. And then it would burn out overnight. And in the morning, they'd come and they'd relight it. Why am I saying this? Because your followers need to remember, to, we have to light the light of justice and compassion yes. every day. Jesus did not just do it once and say, now it's going to be lit all the time. Every day was a day about how am I going to bring more love in the world? How am I going to bring about more justice in the world? How am I going to bring about more compassion in the world? That has to happen every day. Yeah. It's so beautiful. You know, I was with my kids. I brought my kids to Florida uh, for this speaking engagement this weekend. And um, they went over to one of these, um, what is it, Dave and Buster's? They went over to one of these places, <laughs> I don't know. And then they said, anyways, the bottom line was he won a guitar. And he was so excited he won a, a guitar. And, um, but he already has a guitar. And he has a really nice guitar. He has a couple of nice guitars. And he won the guitar <laughs> the morning. That, this was Daniel. He won it the morning. And we're driving to the airport. And he's like, what am I doing with this guitar, Dad? And um, he said, Dad, I've got something I want to do. So he, he ran to the front desk of the hotel. He got paper and, and, and um, tape. And he wrote a note. And he said, uh, I'm, you know, I, this guitar is a, a, a surprise gift for you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then he left his phone number. And he said, Dad, just drive. And so he found a bus stop and he said, dad, stop right here. So I had to pull over the side of the road. He hopped out with the guitar with his note. And he said, here, I'm going to leave it here. Somebody's going to get it. It's going to be great. And he left <laughs> his phone number. So 45 minutes later, we get on the plane. We're sitting on the plane waiting to take off. And he gets a text and somebody found his guitar. And wow. she said, my grandson has wanted a guitar. And I came to the bus stop. And here was this guitar, and my grandson has been asking for a guitar. And so Daniel's going back and forth, and I thought, thank you, God. This is exactly what you want your children to have a heart of generosity, mm -hmm. especially in today's consumeristic, materialistic world. You want them to have a heart of giving. You want them to have a heart of serving and loving. And that's what happens when we daily practice generosity everybody we are we're having an incredible night hey janice it was great to see you at the partners brunch on saturday appreciate all my fort myers family and we're hoping to come back down to fort myers a lot more often this year we're having an amazing night with rabbi uh, jonah pesner uh from the 
uh, Religious Action Center for Reform Judaism. We're studying Vayikra, Leviticus cha uh, chapter 1 through 5. Vayikra means, and he called. Hashem called. The voice of the Lord called to us. God lays out the korbanot, which is sacrifices, but which really uh, means to draw near. This is how we draw near. What does the Bible say? What are the sacrifices God looks for? A broken and a humble heart. Mm -hmm. God looks for hearts of humility, hearts that are willing to be broken, uh, and so that we can be a part then of tikkun olam, of healing our world. Rabbi, very quickly, because our time is slipping away, and I have one other thing I want to get to. Oh, everybody, if you're just uh, tuning in, please hit the share button. Uh, go ahead and hit the share button as quickly as you can and get the word and hit the bell uh, to subscribe on YouTube. Follow us along on our social media. Uh, we've got all kinds of social media things happening. Where are my notes? I was just trying to find something I wanted to ask Rabbi about. Um, Rabbi, oh, there it is. Um, there were five offerings. Is that right, Rabbi? There are five kinds. Yep. Okay. So very quickly walking through those, there's the burnt offering, the grain offering, the fellowship offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering. At least that's what we call them in our circles. The burnt offering, maybe we can get those into the chat. The burnt offering, the grain offering, the fellowship offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering. And Rabbi, we're taught in our uh, commentaries that three of these were voluntary, but two were mandatory. Two absolutely had to be done no matter what. What do you have to say about either the voluntariness and the mandatoriness of these and or these five different offerings? You know, what was what's incredible about these this tradition is the way in which they stay with us today. Um, so the two, the, the for example, like the sin offering versus the guilt offering, there are the things that we do, the transgressions that we're aware of, and we have to make restitution, right? Like you're aware you right. slighted someone, you made a mistake, you need to repair it. And so we, we know those kinds. But what about the inadvertent mistakes that we're not aware of? And so God was very sensitive to say, you're obligated to do restitution for the things you're aware of. But you now, also- Robert, I, mean, I, want to, I want to interrupt you right there. Don't go, go, go. train of thought. Remember that. But I want to, folks, I want, to, I want you to see how serious uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters take this. Because far too often, Christians, uh, we, you know, we, 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 we say we have these things, but the, the, the thing about Judaism in having the liturgy is, uh, aligned with it, it changed. And I want to tell you a story. There was a very, very famous rabbi. I won't say his name. He is known all over the world. Uh, one of the most famous rabbis of the last hundred years. And I had the privilege of knowing him. And um, uh, years ago, uh, he uh, heard something about me, about Eagle's Wings, and it was misinformation. It was wrong information. And he got very, very angry about it. And, and, and he wrote me a letter. Rabbi Pesner, you can't believe the letter that I got. I got this nasty, attacking letter from this rabbi. It was, I was a wreck. And, and I, I, I said, oh, my goodness, this is terrible. And I went back and I sent him the information that he needed to say, no, here's, here's what the truth of this you know, situation was. Here's the point. <clears throat> Do you know that about a week before Yom Kippur, I got the most beautiful letter from this rabbi, mm. the most beautiful letter. And he said this. He said, he said we are days away from Yom Kippur. And I cannot face the Lord on Yom Kippur without taking time to write you and to apologize to you for wrongly judging you in this. I was given misinformation. You've provided me accurate information, but I should not have had anger in my heart. I should not. And, and he, he said, I must before Yom Kippur make this right with you. Can I tell you, you could have knocked me over. Oh, I yeah. thought the, the humility of this powerful rabbi uh, who could have just gone on and that could have just been, you know, he could, he never needed to do that to me for me again, but he took the time to write this beautiful. We then became wonderful friends and partners. Uh, but it was because 
within Judaism, just in the same way we have Shabbat, just in the same way we have Passover. Yeah. It's not just that these things are ethereal, but they are put into the calendar. They are put into the liturgy. They are put into these, these various things. Uh, and so I just think it's such a powerful lesson that Judaism, that Christianity has to learn from Judaism. This is what Jesus said. What did he say? He said, if you're going to offer your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother is angry, leave your gift. Jesus says, forget your gift. The right. gift is to go be made right with your with your brother, with your sister. And yet we we think of those things. Oh well, he you know he doesn't really mean it, but he does. No, he does. So, he, that was very rabbinic of Jesus, right? For sure. Exactly. So, you know, sorry I, to interrupt, Rabbi, but but no, that, you know, it, just, that makes me think of the most important thing. I think I want to share, Bishop, with you and with your with your followers tonight. And that is one of the offerings we call in Hebrew the mincha offering. It's like the meal. And you know, we already talked about the olah, which is the one that's the going up. The mincha is the one that stays down. It's the priests and, and the families all gathering around the table and sharing the meal together. This is really important. You reference tomorrow night, you're going to celebrate Shabbat. You reference that your boys, your twins are going to celebrate their B'nai Mitzvah, and then they're going to have a big festive meal. And one week from tomorrow, the Jewish community and our friends and family and many of you will join for a Passover Seder. Yeah. This, this is the, the crux of the matter, because in many ways, Bishop, the Pesach Seder, the ritual meal, is a reenactment of the mincha offering in this week's Torah portion. It's the offering of the lamb, not the one that gets burnt and offered up to God, but that is shared among those who have come. And we're commanded in the same way that you said earlier, young people have to day after day after day, remember the injunction to do good and to love the way that your son embodied that with the choice he was making. The Passover Seder has a very clear intention. The rabbis say we are commanded to tell the story on that day that we were slaves and then we were free. And therefore they say, is every generation sees themselves as if we, you Bishop Stearns and me, Jonah Pesner, we were slaves and we were freed, that we are commanded 36 different ways, 36 different times in the Torah to love the stranger, not tolerate, not put up with, but to love the stranger. It only says love your fellow once, but it says, love the stranger 36 times. So my plea tonight is as people are gathering for this mincha offering, whatever meal, whether it's a Sunday Sunday dinner, Shabbat dinner, Passover Seder, as we gather with family, let's remember what God wants of us, which is to do justice and to love mercy. And in so doing, to walk humbly with God. Rabbi, it's, it's so beautiful. It's so important. And it's so necessary for our nation right now, that each and every, the only way we are going to see healing come to America, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's just not going to come from uh, political elites. It's not going to come from tech giants. Uh, healing is going to come in America, one heart to one heart, one neighbor to one neighbor, reaching out, as you say, Rabbi, to the other, to the, who is the stranger to us? Who is the Samaritan to us? And as we leave tonight, I just want to bring us to uh, this verse that, as I was reading before, that just leapt out at me. And, and maybe, Rabbi, you can close with just a drosh on this. Leviticus 5.1 says this, if, if, you, if a person si sins because he does not speak up when he hears a public charge to testify regarding something he has seen or learned about, he will be held responsible. So here's this verse that is saying, if you see an injustice happening, if you see something terrible happening to your fellow human being and you don't speak out, there is guilt that comes upon you. And, and we're living in a time right now where, you know, we, we, we look at the terror that just happened in Atlanta uh, yesterday. We look, you know, across our nation, there are horrible things that are happening. And unfortunately, many people are becoming increasingly afraid to say anything. Because if I say anything, I'm going to be canceled. If I say anything, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to lose my job. 
I'm going to lose, you know, I'm going to, they're going to shut me down. But, but the Torah says right here, if you see something happening that is unjust, that is evil, and, and we look, of course, at what it must have been like in Germany in the early 30s, when, when, when culture was becoming increasingly toxic, increasingly dangerous, increasingly polarized. And, and so it is so necessary that we speak out in this hour. Rabbi, any thoughts on that? Amen. And as I think you know, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who came out of Europe, was rescued by the American Jewish community and marched with Dr. King in Selma and was one of the great both rabbis who scholars of the Jewish people, but an activist, used to say about the Holocaust, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Mm. So in this moment, Bishop, when wow. whatever people's politics are, wow. That's the powerful. violence that is happening in our country, whether it was the, the assault on the Capitol or the, the murders just two day, nights ago, none of that is okay. Whatever people's politics are, and we can't be silent because we're all responsible for it. And I agree with you. It's going to happen heart by heart, person by person. And I heard you say earlier, God is in the stillness, is in the quiet. Mm -hmm. God is in the space where we reach to people who are in pain and with whom we may disagree and ask, how are you? Mm -hmm. What's happening for you? How is God in you? And just listen. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. listen. So beautiful, <laughs> Rabbi. You're, you, I'm so honored that our paths have crossed. I am a better person uh, because beautiful. because you are in. Uh, I am because we've connected. Let's and, do it uh, again. I well, we would be honored to have you back on. And please know that you have great friends within the Eagles Wings community, Rabbi. I know people are going to want to know uh, about you and follow you. How do they? Is, do you do you put out, uh, do they follow you on social media? How do they get in touch with you? Sure, just uh, at Jonah Pesner on Twitter, um, or you can check me out on Facebook, or you can visit me at rac.org, rac.org. And that's P-E-S-N-E-R, correct? There we go. Well, folks, this has been another beautiful, beautiful night. What a joy, what a blessing it is. The comments are coming in left and right. I know you've all enjoyed this so much. We've had a great crowd here tonight on Facebook and on YouTube. And uh, you still have time to hit the share button if you've not done that. Tomorrow night, we're together at 6 p.m. for 10 minutes. We'll do the uh, Shabbat Brachot at uh, 6 p.m. So join us here. And then Sunday morning, I'll be preaching at the Tabernacle. So go to the tab.org uh, Sunday morning. Then Tuesday will be uh, Torah Tuesdays at 12 with Mark Gerson. So go to TorahTuesdays.com and just go ahead and uh, sign up. Uh, there's no charge whatsoever, but we'd love you to join us for Tor Tuesdays at 12. Remember that then the following Sunday, I'll be speaking at Calvary in Cranford, New Jersey, and I'll be doing a partner's brunch on Saturday the day before. A few weeks after that, I'll be in Orlando. I apologize. I don't have the date there, but I'll have it for you next time. Uh, and you'll get it on the email as well. And then uh, Orlando is the first, I think, week of April. So lots coming up. Everybody sign up for our trip to Israel. Join us. Go to awakejerusalem.com. We do not know whether or not you've got to have the vaccine to go. <laughs> That's not up to me. Talk to Bibi Netanyahu. We don't know the answer to that. So uh, the minute we know, we will tell you. I'm getting 17 <laughs> phone calls a day. Do I have to have the vaccine to go on the Israel trip? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I have heard that you might not need to have it to go on the trip because so much of Israel is already vaccinated, but I don't have that confirmed. But we will let you know um, and give you all of those details. Rabbi, we are so honored and blessed to have you. Would you come back and teach us again sometime? As soon as you have asked me, I'll be back. Oh, Inani. Right. Inani. We're, I'm so, here. we're so glad. Everybody, God bless you. Have a wonderful night. And remember, keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. God bless everybody.